Hey, good morning, and welcome to worship at St. Stephen Lutheran Church in Stowe, Ohio. This is our gathering for Sunday, March 19th, 2023, the fourth Sunday of the season of Lent. As just a reminder, in the coming weeks, we will gather to observe the culmination of this season, Holy Week, which begins with Palm and Passion Sunday. And I would invite you, part of our digital community, to plan on or do what you can to be able to join us during Holy Week and on Resurrection Sunday here in person at St. Stephen. I would love to see you. This morning's worship begins, as usual, with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with you for each of these 40 days, and who sustains you with the gift of God's grace. Amen. Gathered together this morning, let us acknowledge before God our need for repentance and for God's great mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt, though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion, and so we ask that you would forgive us, renew us, and lead us. And do this as, filled with your Holy Spirit, we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Child of God, hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son, so that you and all may receive life. This promise? It's for you. God embraces you with divine mercy. God forgives you in Christ's name, and God receives you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had former, formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about it? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight, and asked them, Is this your son, who you say has been born blind? How then does he now see? The parents answered, We know that this is our son, 
and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. The parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, so the question here is, how observant are you? The question is, what is this? And what do you see? Of course you notice that I have a new hairdo, that I have on a pink wig, right? But did you notice Jesus over my shoulder? With the amount of stuff that we see, that our eyes take in, the question isn't how much there is to see and how much bombards us, the question is how observant we are. What does this mean? What do we make of it? So this is going to be a practice in observation. This is going to be a moment, a time taken, for thinking, for observation, for holy sight. This is going to be time taken out of our week in which we think about what we see. So in the next few moments I'm going to ask you to look at some things. And as you look at them I'm going to ask you what you think. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why you're seeing this. What is this? What does this mean? What do you see? These are keyboard cookies, right? Are these uh, cookies that you enjoy? Would you eat Chips Deluxe? A number of years ago, 
while I was still in seminary, while in theory I was being taught how to do this job at least uh, manageably. One of the practices that we did was called a found text sermon. A found text sermon. And the night before the assignment, I was packing my boys' lunch. And while I was packing their lunch, I was putting in little packages of keyboard cookies. And this became my found text. Do you see the lower corner there? Chocolate in every bite. A found text sermon is coming across something in everyday life, something that bombards you just like everything else, but that you take out a moment to see. And this was my text, chocolate in every bite. The sermon uh, was about who we think we are, about uh, how easy it is for us to lose our sense of gratitude. Oh, I just am down here packing another lunch. Oh, I need to make sure that we have chocolate in every bite. But when I gave this sermon, it was about a month uh, after a very severe earthquake in Haiti, where the idea is just the opportunity to get a bite, any bite, let alone chocolate in every bite. And the sermon was about how God provides for us, and how sometimes we run amok with that because we think we need chocolate in every bite. And the sermon was about how simple God's presence is, and how easy it would, it would be to be gracious and full of gratitude. That God doesn't uh, come to us in the sacrament of keyboard cookies, but in the sacrament of bread. And there is not chocolate in any bite, but that it's enough. And so that's my found text sermon. And this is a practice in the same thing for you. A practice where I hope our faith and our gathering together is about more than just me talking to you, but it's a practice in how to live as people of faith in our world. It's a found text sermon, but it's an example of observing. How observant are you? What does this mean? What do you see? What kind of person do you think would put out a sign like this? This is a no signs allowed sign. This picture is taken in a yard that serves as uh, basically the entrance into my allotment. It's not far from the street where I turn into my allotment every week. And as the weather has gotten better, uh, this person has put out this sign. It's a bit of a head scratcher to me. Were the amount of signs that were being posted in their yard so severe that they had to take the time for this? Do they know that they're being ironic? That in posting a sign that's trying to stop more signs, they really are just doing the thing they're trying to get other people to stop? Does it work? I have never in my life seen any signs ever posted in this yard, whether this sign has been out or not. What caused them to put this out? Is it some sort of commentary on the life that we live in? This has become a found text for me. And I know at this point what you're thinking. Boy, it's possible to overthink things, and maybe that's true. But I am hoping to sit with you in a few moments of peace, where we think about being observant and thoughtful, where we think about who we are as people of faith, uh, as saved people of God. So what do you think? What do you see here? Do you think this person knows that they're being ironic? Do you think they know that it's humorous? What is the point? What happens to people that's made them uh, want to feel like they need to put out this sign? All right? What does this mean? What do you see here? Again, not very far from my house and really not all that far from that yard that has that sign in it is this moderately busy intersection. Earlier this week, uh, these flags began to blossom or be uh, planted. Uh, the kind that are on those little metal poles and the little plastic flags flapping. And, and then eventually uh, this. Sanitation services is what the sign says, which you can't see. Uh, showed up. What do you see? What is this? 
all week it's blown my mind that uh, this is where they're going to set this. If I was out here working, I've had to think about whether I would hold it or whether I would really want to uh, be going in and out of this thing about a foot away from where people were stopping at the stop sign. I discovered this week that I was so sort of engrossed by why they set this here and not maybe further back into the trees that I didn't even pay attention. Although there are no signs up, there are these little flags and there is now this sanitation services thing. And I tried coming through here a day after I took this picture and everything was closed down because the entire intersection was being reworked and dug up. Which means I wasn't all that observant. I was so worried about why someone would be going in and out of this porta potty so close to the stop sign that I got myself a little aggravated getting stuck here. What might it look like to be observant? Is it possible to not see the forest for the trees? Is our life of faith a call to being more observant? What does this mean? What is this? What do you see? To be, to be completely honest with you, this is a, a picture that I did not take, I took from the internet. But about a week ago, a week from when you're watching this, I was leaving St. Stephen at about one o'clock on Sunday after church in a van that had this printed on the side drove past, an Amazon van, right? And I noticed it then, but just in case I didn't notice it, by the time I got to the freeway and started to head south, I came across the, not one, not two, but three more of these vans in a convoy going down the freeway with the exact same thing printed on them. And then I've seen them in my neighborhood with this statement printed on them. Warning, contents may cause happiness. And what I'm wondering about is how observant we are. What does this mean? Contents may cause happiness. Like, buy something and oh, to have your life be dependent on the route and the delivery schedule, and when it gets to you, test to see if it made you happy, if it fixed things? Is this what we've come to? Contents may cause happiness, that our happiness is dependent on what we've purchased and how long it takes to get to us? What does this mean? What do you see? Here's another one. What does this mean? What do you see here? I don't know how up on it you are, but these are two logos of professional football teams from the United States. The one with the blue background is the Detroit Lions. Uh, the one with the sort of white shield uh, circling it is the Las Vegas Raiders. And this has become something of a found text for me while I practiced being more observant this week. The Detroit Lions uh, are a team that one of the people who comes to our pantry always wears stuff for. And when he walks in, I always tell him, as I tell so many of the people of St. Stephen when they gather in this building, uh, that that's the wrong team, they're supporting the wrong team, that I'm not sure how I feel about it, you know, all the stuff that I say. And so this person normally comes decked out in Detroit Lions stuff because he is, quote, from Detroit. But, this week he came in and he had on Raiders stuff. And I had to say, well, you know, that's not allowed in here either. Good try, thanks for switching it up, but that doesn't work either. And I gave him a hard time and chatted with him a little bit. And he said uh, that he was wearing Raiders today because his grandmother passed away not all that long ago. And that this is the last thing that she had given him, a hat that said Raiders. And so I asked him about his grandma and I talked to him uh, in a way that uh, got to a depth we haven't gotten to, and I uh, told him that of course this isn't the right team either, but that uh, you know he could wear the hat inside out where you wouldn't be able to see this logo, and uh, that when people said, why is your hat inside out, he could still tell the story about his grandma and not have to support this other team. But what I would have been appreciative of, of is the found text of this logo, and the ability to chit-chat and for that to become a deeper connection. And so sometimes uh, these found texts, when we're observant, can be connective and be more meaningful. And this is a found text sermon. I don't know if you've ever sat through one of these. They don't have much rhyme or reason other than these are things that have crossed my path. And to live as a baptized child of God means to be observant. And that in 
the texts that come across our path, God can be revealed. Another one. What is this? What do you see here? This is the gospel for this morning as it's printed in this morning's bulletin, right? And this is a probably more intentionally found text, but a found text nonetheless. I'll point out to you uh, in this uh, that in the very beginning, it says that Jesus was walking along and he came across a man uh, who was blind from birth. And it doesn't just say that he came across a man, but it says that he saw this man who was blind from birth. He sees a man who doesn't see. And what's caught my attention in that story in this text uh, this week is that uh, the most of the rest of the story, indeed, this is the one of the longest, this is the longest section in all of the Gospels where Jesus disappears. He's gone uh, after a bit here in 27 verses of this reading, the longest disappearance he has in all of the Gospels. And it happens because the man who Jesus heals goes before the Pharisees and they aren't sure whether he's the same man as the blind guy that they walk past all the time. They want him to prove his identity to them even though they've passed him every day for years, and he's been invisible to them. And that emphasizes the idea that Jesus saw him, and that that's where this story begins. Jesus saw him. And to be very clear about what he saw, uh, I want to point out something else to you here. Uh, Jesus has asked these theological questions. Who sinned? Who, who, was his dad a smoker or something? Is that why he was born blind? Or did his mom dance at the town dance too much or something? Is that why he's blind? And Jesus doesn't really want to sit in the debating of this. And he says, uh, neither this man nor his parents sinned. And then, as we have it, the text says, he was born blind. But here's an interesting thing, which you wouldn't see from our bulletin, and no matter how hard you were observe, observe this, you might not ever see it. The original Peter doesn't say he was born blind. It says he was born, and the copyist put in blind later. It actually says that neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born so that God's works might be revealed. The things that we come across exist so that God might be revealed. And it starts with Jesus seeing this man. And in his being seen, he is made who he is, just as you are seen as God's child, and in that you are saved and made who you are. And you are made who you are so that you may find texts, be observant, and come to know and to proclaim and stand up for God's presence in the world. Just to talk to you about how long uh, this gospel text is for this week, what is this? Well, this is the second page of the same reading, and uh, you'll notice that it's the, the blind man having to tell people that he really is who he says he is, and Jesus is missing from all these verses, the longest section in the gospels that he's missing from. Then it's this proclamation of the blind man saying that it's not so much about uh, figuring out why I can see as being happy uh, that there's someone who can do this. And it's a story about how easy it is uh, to worry more about getting chocolate in every bite than in the idea that God has given us the bites that we have and there is some healing and gratitude in that. And so the practice of being observant is a practice of considering why a guy would post a sign that's uh, uh, saying no more signs. It's about uh, seeing the signs of an intersection that's about to be closed down before it is to maybe save you. Uh, it's, it's questioning some of our habits. With these contents, we have to buy things to feel happiness. It's opening the doors of the church and having somebody come into the pantry and just by asking questions about a switch up in their logos, finding that ours is a facility and a place, a city on a hill of comforting and keeping. One more found text. What does this mean? What do you see? 
this is a screen grab from the website that I've spent like 20 hours on this week and that I'm still hopeful and in process of trying to get up because I don't know if you've been observant or not, but our own website has been down for months and months and months and the time has come to rectify that. And so this is a screen grab from a portion of that new website, a, a teaser. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, you can check it out and see that we have the bulletin and the steeple views and links to videos like the one that you're watching. But this particular screen grab exists for this text, epic worship, experiential, participatory, image-rich, connecting. You see, I believe that God has given you five senses. And I believe in the modern world, in our contemporary world, in the time that we live, our senses are completely bombarded constantly with all sorts of content, uh, but that you would have to be the person who Jesus sees you as in order to sort through all of this stuff. You know that it's important for me to make worship about more than just what you hear, but also about what you see that it need to be image rich. But the idea here is, is that to see is not to be bogged down in everything else, but to know how to pick what you see and to occasionally dive deeper into it in order for God to be at work. You see, the challenge for you and I is to see ourselves as God sees us. The challenge for you and I is to see God as God is. We're often uh, so bombarded uh, with, with images and sounds and things hitting our senses uh, that being observant uh, isn't necessarily something that we're good at. Maybe sometimes we might as well be blind. And maybe the story of the blind man today, the found text, is about being seen by God for who we are and what we are in the midst of. You are who God sees you as. You are seen first by Jesus himself. And just as Jesus is God's son, God himself present in our world, you live in a world where texts and people and experiences that you have are a place to feel and to know and to share God's presence. If only you are observant, and if you know that yours is the chance to proclaim. People are all the time pursuing faith because they're trying to define who Jesus is or who he isn't. They're all the time trying to tell you these stories about what God would do or what God wouldn't do. But to me, the story of John 9 and of our baptismal life is whether we can see ourselves as what God sees us as. Worthy, gifted, sinful, yes, but uh, capable when the Holy Spirit lives in us. There are times for speaking, there are times for practicing observation in a different way, which is a thing that we've done in this found text sermon for the last few minutes. There are times to be called into seeing or being uh, in the presence of God in a different way. But maybe the most beautiful thing, maybe the most uh, wonderful part of being a person of faith is not seeing or thinking about it or just sitting with it but it's enacting, enacting God's presence in the world. You see, to me, the best found text is not all these pictures that I show. It's you. God sees you for who you are. You are a text of God's own kingdom. And my hope is, is that you may live like it. We observe, we sit and practice, considering what we've observed, but maybe the most beautiful thing, child of God, is when you enact it. Amen. Gracious God, in the middle of the season of Lent, we are fully aware of who we are. We know our relationship to you, but we ask
ask that you would bend your ear to our prayers. We ask that you would come into our midst. We know that by the story of your gracious life, by our understanding of your death for us, you, through the Holy Spirit, bring light into our darkness. You set light into our very hearts, and you anoint us with this Holy Spirit. We know this because it is you that lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, 